I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this. Usually what happens in a schematic is you try to design them. You have more than one page, right? Just like you have on your blueprints. It's going from left to right. Left is input, right is output. So what you'll see here is you'll see this symbol right here, this point here, which is one of the symbols representing an antenna. And what this is, is this is a radio. Schematic of a simple radio. And you'll notice that we have many frequencies out there, don't we? So this first circuit after this antenna is what we call a tuned circuit or a bandpass filter, meaning we select the radio station we want. And when you learn more about resonance, you'll find that at resonance, which is the actual carrier wave of the radio station, you get maximum voltage input. And we'll see how as we go along. Now that's an RF frequency. RF stands for radio frequency. See the RF amp? So this is a schematic diagram. And the RF amp boosts that signal. And that, of course, an RF amp is more expensive to make and much broader and be more careful about it. So we're boosting this up to increase the signal. The signal needs to be high. Otherwise, if we didn't boost it up, we'd have maybe 25, 30% of our signal noise. So we're selecting that signal to boost it up, so maybe we only end up with 1% of noise. Because even noise will be amplified by the following stages. Now right here, what happens is we're going to ignore this part of the circuit right now. And what happens is it transfers over to effectively this point here, and it goes in through what we call a mixer. Now what happens is you have a, what they call a beat frequency oscillator, which is one that you combine with your RF signal. Now what happens is when you put two signals together, you have the original two, two signals, the sum of the two, and the difference of the two. And the lower frequency is the difference. So you want to zero in on that difference frequency because it's lower frequency and easier to work with. So you'll see that the first thing we go into is a low pass filter. You'll see that this is made up of capacitor, resistor, inductor, capacitor, capacitor, resistor. That's a type of filter. Now later on today we'll actually see more combinations of how filters are made. So it's a pass. So that's signaling a that's getting the different signal, and uh, that's what you want because it's lower of the frequencies. In that difference signal is the modulated and it has the audio frequency. Audio is typically from 20 to 20 kilohertz. Now that's what we say anyway when the baby's born. Now if you were uh, one of these guys that put a great big speaker in your car, closed all the windows, and raised the bass up, you don't have good hearing anymore. That's one of the problems. Ever listen to the movies on the um, on the airplanes without noise canceling headsets? You're jacking that dog on volume way up. And the best way to listen to a movie on a, on a on the plane is to get noise canceling headsets and then use that. The volume's not up that high. Now what happens here is that we now look at this. This is using a transistor. See this symbol here? It's a transistor. See that little squiggly thing? That's a resistor. We have a switch. See the switch, which is back and forth. It's in this position, and it goes through this capacitive, resistive, capacitive network, and then it goes into this special device called an operational amplifier. An operational amplifier is kind of an interesting tool. It can be made to do anything, literally. It's extremely versatile. In the early days of operational amplifiers, uh, Burr Brown was one of them that did a lot of work in that area, and they made them out of individual components. And in the 1968-67 era, that operational amplifier cost $300. Now let me give you an idea what that is. That was a Typically, about three-quarters 
of an engineer's salary when they graduated in 1968. 300 bucks. A lot of money. Of course, you could buy a house, you could do all kinds of things. With the 300, you can't do today. So, this is a high pass filter. So, it's taking frequencies uh, that we have down here and taking the high pass frequency, then a low pass frequency, and then a low pass filter. So, we're narrow narrowing in basically on the analog signal between 20 and 20 kilohertz. And by the way, we will go into these in more detail. Now, what happens is that analog signal is then sent into an audio amplifier. The purpose of the audio amplifier is to boost up that 20 to 20 kilohertz signal and then match what they call impedance. Now, impedance is actually resistance, capacitance, and inductance that exists. And all those exist on the speaker. Basically, you're driving a speaker, aren't you? basically what you're doing. So what happens here is that's driving the speaker and that's interfacing with the air. Now impedance is kind of an interesting property. It turns out air has an impedance. 377 ohms. And you notice the speaker's got a cone like this, doesn't it? Like this? See down in the schematic symbol? That's because speakers are matching a low impedance typically to a higher impedance of 377 ohms. That's the purpose of it. So what will happen now is that that sound will come out. I'd like to point out something here. See this symbol right here? The one that looks like a comb? That's known as chassis ground or signal ground. One of the problems is when they use ground, which we'll cover another symbol, a little bit, is that it gets very confusing and if you hook things up wrong, you create a condition called ground loops. You've probably heard about that a lot. And ground loops can contribute a lot to noise, especially 60 hertz. So it has to do with the way things are hooked up. So these are some of the symbols we've looked at so far. Notice the fixed value resistor. When you make that variable, is you draw an arrow through it. If you draw an arrow through it, that means it can change. And if you take a look at the old potentiometers you have on devices, where you're changing the amplitude or the volume, that's basically a variable resistor. Here's a fixed value capacitor. There's a bar across the top and a little arc on the bottom. That used to be the way they designated electrolytic capacitors. We'll learn more about those when we take a look at it when we talk about capacitors. Between the plates, there's an electrolyte. And the thinner that is, the closer you can get the plates, and the higher you can make the capacitance. This shows you a ground connection. That's actually signal ground. This is an antenna, another symbol. This is a symbol for the NPN bipolar transistor. NPN, negative, positive, negative. Notice the way the arrow is positioned. This right here is an N-channel junction FET. FET stands for field effect transistor. And we'll go over the description of how that works. Notice this squiggly line? Sometimes you see only two. Like I was looking at the amateur radio handbook and they've moved it down to there's just two loops. So you'll see variations of this throughout the different documentation you have. All the way from very old to very new. You've got some old documentation, don't you, Martin? Mm -hmm. Now you've got some new documentation. So you kind of have to learn to look and realize that they can vary in different ways. This is an operational amplifier. Now, this can be done two ways. Sometimes it's just a straight line versus the curved line. Of course, the curved line gives it a little more beauty, right? And it turns out that the plus and the minuses are put on the inputs. That's how you can tell an operational amplifier versus the transistor, which is up here, or an FET, which is here. See how the symbols have changed? I do not expect you to memorize them at all. 
Notice here, this is a diode. A diode allows current to flow in one direction. And what happens with that diode is that um, it's also a slash rectifier because you combine the diodes into certain circuits to rectify your AC to be pulsating DC. See that? And we'll see a look at that. And then, of course, if you have a transformer with a core, and you see the bars in the middle, that indicates iron core, which typically is low frequency. Now, we consider low frequency anything from where to where. Take a look at your chart back there. Remember that? Where does it say low frequency is from? That was D, wasn't it? Actually, electromagnetic was C, 125. What's it say, uh, Vernon, for low frequency? Uh, somewhere right in, in the kilohertz or hertz. Low frequency. What's yeah. the high range? Uh, that would be like 300 kilohertz. Yeah, see, it's not just hertz, right? Low frequency is considered from very low to up there to approximately 300 kilohertz. See, that's what I wanted to point out that that symbol defines a band of frequencies you're working with. But most people consider like power line frequencies, which are 60 hertz, audio 20 to 20 kilohertz. Now you see the iron core transfer inductor, the top there where it shows an inductor with the iron core, that's typically used as a filter in a current power supply. That can be used for other areas. RF, AGC. Now that's automatic gain control. Now that's a circuit which we'll go over in more detail in a little bit. CW is continuous wave. SSB is what they call single sideband. Remember when I told you you mixed two signals together? What did you end up getting? The sum and the difference, right? And the sum is considered a sideband, and the difference is considered a sideband. Which one do you go after? It just depends on the filter you're working with, the one you're interested in. Remember I mentioned in a radio you want to keep as low frequency as you can because there's less radiation and interference, and it would zero in on the lower sideband. And then, of course, the mixer is a general term where it combines the signal with the uh, local oscillator frequency to original, Creating two new frequencies. Now, if you look at this particular circuit, it contains a passive filter. What did I tell you about a passive filter? What is that? Some three components, and what are they? Give me one. Capacitor, you said? That's one. How about you, Martin? I don't know. Good answer. <laughs> Jessica, what's another one? Resistor. Resistor. You know the last one, Eric? How about you, Kristen? Inductor. So the three capacitive, uh, capacitive circuit components are one capacitor, Jessica, resistor, Martin, correct. Okay, simple as that. One tune circuit. That tune circuit is selecting one of the sidebands, isn't it? Or actually, no, the tune circuits on the input of the antenna because the antenna interfaces and gets all the frequencies of all the radio stations or TV stations or whatever it's designed for. And so that tune circuit's selecting the radio station. Three active filter circuits containing op amps. Why is it active? Something to input. Transistors use voltages to set levels, don't they? And the op ramp requires voltages to work. That's an active circuit. Two amplifiers that use transistors. That's different than an op amp. What did I tell you about an op amp? What are the ways of seeing that it's an op amp? What's on the inputs? Plus and minus. And depending on what kind of circuit you're making, which we'll go over a series of those on the, actually the fourth day, you'll be able to see how it works. And one amplifier that uses an FET. Field effect transistor. Now, what it amounts to is the FET has an extremely high input impedance or resistance. Have you ever heard the term loading? 
we'll cover it in more detail. But you, you all said you wanted to know about instrumentation, right? And I'll have a demonstration of showing you what happens when you load making a measurement and what can happen to your signal. This is what they call a black diagram, what we just looked at. Tells you functionally what's going on, doesn't it? Doesn't tell you how it's going on, though. The trouble is that most documentation, this is all they give you now, isn't it? If that. Have you ever gone? Now, do, you have, do you have a fries here? I can do it. But what happens there is you go in and you have this device you want to get a schematic of over the internet. Go over the internet and it gives you a data sheet. This is a weighs two pounds. It works with a 110 and it's green. I don't call that a data sheet. And you don't really get the data sheets. Now, what this is doing is taking the functionality. Like one, a signal from the antenna. Then you have the bandpass filter, the RF amplifier, the automatic gain. Now, what I'll do is I'll explain this feedback that you have. At this point, what happens is this AGC, automatic gain compensation detector, senses when the signal drops down. Then it goes into the driver, which then goes into this control. And what happens then is it's combined with a signal to keep the level. If you didn't, as you drove, let's say, around on a road, your signals would change, and you would end up getting your music and voices going up and down and up and up and down. Ever have that? Especially when you go into, let's say, a uh, bridge. That can happen normally, so it compensates for the signal to boost it up when it gets too low and drop it down when it gets too high. On a gain detector. This is looking at the actual bandpass filter. You see that this is an adjustable inductance. What makes, how can you tell it's adjustable? Barrel. Correct. How can you tell it's an inductor? Right. That's right. This right here is two plates. What kind of device is that? Is it fixed or adjustable? Fixed. Fixed, absolutely. What is this? It says ground connection, but I prefer to use chassis, ground. chassis or signal ground. I prefer to do that. RF stands for? Radio frequency. Correct, radio frequency. The radio frequency is higher, and what we need to do is we get it off the antenna. It's very, very low. We're down in the microvolt level. Thing of this is to boost it up maybe into the 200 microvolt level, where the signal is much higher than the noise. This may be down a microvolt. This is that gain control we're talking about. Let's go over to the mixer. This is a low pass filter. Now, tomorrow we'll be able to explain this and how it mathematically works, describing on which things increase and which ones decrease. This is the audio preamplifier. The signal's down in the millivolt level. We can't drive a speaker when it's in the millivolt level. We need to boost it up. This is showing you a more detailed, complex filter. This is called an active filter because you have an active device in it. Operational amplifier. By the way, operational amplifiers are now about 50 cents. And they're on a chip which is fairly balanced. And when we talk about the construction, we'll see how that works. That's a lot better than 300 bucks, isn't it? And plus, they don't have to be um, balanced as well as the other ones did, because the older ones were made out of individual components. Here's our speaker. This is the amplifier driving the speaker. Notice the plus. That means that's a plus voltage. See plus 12 here, down here. Notice here, minus 12. Operational amplifiers are typically driven. The voltage is the supply, a term which they use in transistors called bias. That's how you establish the levels that are within a particular device. They're <coughs> plus and minus voltage as their source. They're always working with DC. And we'll see how we can 
combine the components. So if they say uh, we want a certain bias, that means you that's you're going to use with that connection whether you raise it, the different components is to, to maintain that bias, right? Well, on, on a typical transistor, it uses what they call a Volts divider, which is nothing more than two resistors in series. And then when they hook it up, it establishes a forward bias, forward voltage, between the emitter and the base, and a reverse bias between the base and the collector. These are terms which you'll learn today. But the biasing is basically the voltage levels. And whether it's an FET, field effect transistor, or a transistor, or another device depends on what it is, how you set it up. But it typically uses resistor dividers. We have a voltage on the top, it gets so much across here, so much across here, so much across here. That's the kind of thing you learn in your mechanical engineering, as far as Ohm's law. This is just kind of showing you application of electrical components in a computer case. Now, you, you know, realize that people still use desktops. Why do they typically still use desktop? In some cases they're cheaper, but in many cases they're more expensive. And that's because they have higher speed devices a lot of time now. This drive is much higher speed, much more complex. The video interface is interfacing to a gaming console or something like that, which requires a lot of speed. 